Our speaker tonight attended undergraduate and law school at Temple. He practiced law. He served in the Justice Department under the great Ed Meese. He became the head of the Landmark Legal Foundation. He began a radio show, which is the fastest growing and one of the largest in the land. He is the author of three best-selling books, most recently, Liberty and Tyranny, which has sold more than a million copies. These are great and wonderful things, and I can interpret the man for you. The reason I can do this is because I have known him since 1996. I spent some serious time with him in the summer of that year when he was a Lincoln Fellow in Claremont where I was working. And I can tell you some things about him. He was uh, pugnacious back then. I have a fellow who works with me in the college. His name is Kenny Cole, and he's a wrestler by trade. And uh, I mean, he, when he was a high school guy, he's actually the chief financial officer of the college. And, and, uh, he, but he's a wrestler, that's his nature. And I, I notice about him that uh, if we're having a meeting and something bad is happening and somebody says, well, you know, we have to uh, you know, be careful here, we can't really. Kenny is always the one who, you know, he's like John there, too. John's like this, too. You know, if you work with people a lot, it's like war, and you come to love them and know them really well. Kenny always takes this little half step forward, right? Mark turns to face the enemy. It's like a dog who likes to hunt. <laughs> you could see in him back then that although you couldn't imagine the particular dispute, the National Education Association should be careful. Because <laughs> if they're actually, in fact, going to break the law, it might cause them trouble. Somebody might not be afraid. But there is also about him another thing. He is a student. With that combination of assertion and humility, that make learning possible. We found this determined and aggressive man, who, you know, by the way, he was a lawyer, and these days they think they know about the Constitution. They actually think that the Constitution is a string of court cases. <laughs> you know, which is another idea that's stupid. You know, it's stupid. It, 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 can't, it should not survive the laugh test. And so we thought about this guy, we thought, you know, he's this lawyer, you know, and we, and I'll confess to you, when I was younger, I was a little cocky. <laughs> and we thought, we're really going to teach this guy. What happened was, we loved him right away, and he taught us, because he disappeared, and we disappeared, and there was only the things that we were studying. And the beauty of them was apparent to us, to each other, one another, as fellow students. And he comported himself with service and humility. And we loved him for that. And today, I mean, in, in an intermediate day, if you can imagine an intermediate day from back then when he wasn't famous to now when he's like this big cheese, <laughs> we used to name who are the best of these guys who came through there. Steve Hayes, who's on Fox News, he's another one of them. He's a very, very fine man. If you see him on TV, you can just look at him and you say, somebody who really knows him knows this is a fine guy. And that's what we think about this guy. And I will tell you, the last uh, two days, three days, I've been going around talking only to the very best members of Congress. I was able to have meetings with them all. There aren't many. <laughs> but you know, uh, Peter Roscombe was here earlier. Peter has a, uh, a daughter at Hillsdale College. He will do whatever I say. <laughs> he is a great man. He's marvelous. John Shattuck, I've known him forever. Tom McClintock used to work for me. 
And I went around with them and I said something that I will now say of my friend right here. The philosopher, as we call him, Aristotle writes that the highest human association is friendship and friendship is reserved for those souls who have disciplined themselves to put the best things the highest and who recognize that in one another. And he says that friendship binds the city together and makes it work. And I will tell you then two things. And the first one is the people who govern us today underestimate the force of that. And the second is I introduce to you my friend Mark Levin. speechless. <laughs> Go to a commercial or something. Well, Larry Arn is everything you hear. He's brilliant. He's faithful to his family and his country. He's a patriot. And he runs the finest educational institution in the nation. and he's turned it even into a better educational institution. And what's so unique about Larry is he's not only creating the future statesmen of this nation, and God knows we need them, but right now, today, he's trying to reach out to the American people from that campus in the middle of Michigan, really in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Can't you move the damn place? I'll be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> It's actually a beautiful campus. They tell me it's 90 miles from Detroit. Should be 200 miles from Detroit. Well, I don't give a lot of speeches. This year I'll give three. I gave one at the Federalist Society. In March I'll give one at the Reagan Library. And I'm giving this one tonight because this organization means an enormous amount to me. And if we don't reach the next generation, it's over. And I'm being perfectly honest about this. The key to America's greatness is the civil society. Aristotle, Cicero, Montesquieu, Locke, Burke, Smith, the founding fathers, they all addressed it in one form or another. The civil society recognizes the individual as a unique spiritual being with a soul and a conscience. It's built on a transcendent moral order, as Edmund Burke and many others have described it. In the civil society, the individual has a duty to provide for himself and his family. He has a duty to be a good citizen. He contributes voluntarily to the well-being of his community, church, synagogue, and he respects the unalienable rights of others. The civil society has a cultural identity that consists of traditions and values and customs tried and tested over time and passed from one generation to the next, as Larry was talking about. And in the civil society, private property and liberty are inseparable. The individual's right to live freely and safely and to pursue happiness includes the right to acquire and possess property. Property 
is the manifestation of the individual's physical and intellectual labor. To illegitimately seize it is to enslave him. A just and predictable rule of law provides the governing framework that undergirds and nurtures the civil society. In our case, the United States Constitution. For the conservative, the preservation and improvement of the civil society is paramount if we are to maintain a humane and free country. For the alternative is one form or another tyranny. The modern liberal is not liberal at all. The classical liberal is the opposite of an authoritarian. The modern liberal is a statist. That is, he promotes what de Tocqueville accurately described as a soft tyranny. Now what do I mean by this? The statist is at war with the civil society. He rejects the Declaration of Independence, which says in part, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are words rarely taught in our elementary schools today. For the statist, individuals pursuing their own legitimate interests living independent and self-sufficient lives, largely unencumbered by government, is an intolerable condition. And it's about time that we stop giving the status the benefit of the doubt and accept the fact that he does not share our passion for liberty and the good that flows from it. The status is basically a malcontent. He's miserable about his circumstances, and he blames it not on himself, but on his surroundings, on other people, on society generally. He searches for significance and even glory in a utopian fiction of his mind's making, the earthly attainment of which he believes is frustrated by those who do not share it. So he sets out to destroy the civil society. And that is exactly what Barack Obama and Congress are doing today. Now on the other hand, we conservatives understand that liberty is precious and once lost is rarely recovered. We know of the fall of past republics. We know that the best, the best way forward is not by further empowering an already enormous federal government beyond its constitutional limits, but to return to the founding principles. A free people living in a civil society working in self-interested cooperation, and a government operating within the limits of its authority, promote more prosperity, opportunity, and happiness for more people than any alternative. <laughs> Conservatism is the antidote to tyranny, precisely because its principles are the founding principles. One of the most effective, yet pernicious, tools of the statist is language. Abraham Lincoln explained it this way, and I'm so taken by this quote, I put it on the back of my book. We all declare for liberty, but in using the same word, we do not all mean the same thing. With some, the word liberty may mean for each man to do as he pleases with himself and the product of his labor while with others the same word may mean for some men to do as they please with other men and the product of other men's labor. Here are two not only different but incompatible things called by the same name, liberty. And it follows that each of the things is by the respective parties called two different and incompatible names, liberty and tyranny. So for the statist, Tormenting us, controlling us, dictating to us, seizing from us, is explained as liberty. For the rest of us, it's tyranny. The status misuses the word equality, and to great effect. 
as he pursues uniform economic and social outcomes. And in this regard, he promises to make that which is imperfect perfect, and that which is impossible possible, if only you will surrender more and more of your liberty and property to him. Only then can his utopia, such as it is, be achieved. Consequently, the status rejects rights as being unalienable. Instead, he assumes the authority to determine who has rights and who does not, and rations them accordingly. Last year in his commencement speech to the graduating class at Wellesleyan University, Barack Obama made the point. Among other things, he said, our individual salvation depends on collective salvation. Well, salvation is not governments to give. It's not a grant to mankind from mankind. And under the wrong conditions and in the wrong hands, this deviant view is a powerful tool against humanity. He didn't say that, I said that. <laughs> and yet, this is where we are today. Although the soft tyranny has been building for decades, the most brazen and dangerous war against the civil society is being waged as we gather here now by this president and this Congress. They are scheming against the individual, liberty, private property, the rule of law, and ultimately future generations. And they are pushing on multiple fronts. In less than 10 months, Obama and congressional Democrats have, in effect, nationalized many of our largest banks by using TARP funds to buy their stock. They have eviscerated the nation's bankruptcy laws by turning Chrysler and GM over to the UAW, an unsecured debtor, and strong-armed secured investors. They are nationalizing the student loan system. They are claiming the power to dictate lending terms offered by mortgage companies and interest rates by credit card companies. They seek to dictate management salaries and bonuses. And in certain industries, they seek to compel unionization of the workforce, that is, voting without a secret ballot. Obama and Congress have used the recession to launder tens of billions of dollars in phony stimulus bill money to their favorite political constituencies including ACORN, the SEIU, and politicians and bureaucrats and state and local governments. In fact, so irresponsible, arrogant, and ideologically driven is this administration and Congress that they adopted a budget that will create nearly $20 trillion in debt over the next decade, which the Congressional Budget Office declared unsustainable. This was done at the same time the Federal Reserve pumped the trillions of dollars into the financial system. Current fiscal and monetary policy has turned America into the largest debtor nation the world has ever known. It threatens to destroy our currency through inflation, the full faith and credit of the United States government, and the liberty, opportunities, and security of future generations born and unborn. That is a contemptible disgrace. And they're not done. As further evidence of their compassion and good deeds, Obama and Congress are in the midst of nationalizing 17% of our economy, better known as the health care system. The government has already run up over $55 trillion in unfunded obligations for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid entitlements. Now, how do they justify this? Well. They do it as they always do. Everyone should have affordable, quality health care. And the only way to accomplish that, of course, is for the government to take it over. And that's what Obama and Congress are doing and promising. By the way, have you noticed that the status can't quite get his propaganda straight? On the one hand, he promises national health care that will ensure quality care for all Americans. On the other hand, they say, we spend too much on health care and we need to cut out tests, medicines, procedures, technologies that are too costly. 
Well, which is it? Do we spend too much or do we spend too little? It doesn't really matter, does it? They don't really care, do they? John Cassidy, writing in the left-wing New Yorker the other day, put it this way. So what does it all add up to? The U.S. government is making a costly and open-ended commitment to help provide health coverage for the vast majority of its citizens. I support this commitment, and I think the federal government's spending priorities should be altered to make it happen, he writes. But let's not pretend that it isn't a big deal, or that it will be self-financing, or that it'll work out exactly as planned. It won't. He said, many Democratic insiders know all this, or most of it. What is really unfolding, I suspect, is the scenario that many conservatives feared. The Obama administration is creating a new entitlement program, which, once established, will be virtually impossible to rescind. At some point in the future, the fiscal consequences of the reform will have to be dealt with in a more meaningful way. But by then, the principle of universal coverage will be well established. Even a 21st century Ronald Reagan would have great difficulty overturning it. And as the great Milton Friedman explained, once the whole population is covered by health insurance, there's little political incentive to increase spending on medical care. Once the bulk of costs have been taken over by government, as they have in many other countries, the politician does not have the carrot of increased services with which to attract new voters. So attention turns to holding down costs. In other words, rationing. Expenses explode, services denied, the iron fist is put in place. Uh, for the status, this is the ultimate authority over the individual. He has always craved. Once the individual is entrapped, the status controls his fate. The individual will be seduced by the notion that he's receiving benefits from the state when in reality the government is simply rationing benefits. The individual is tethered to the state, relying on it for his health and survival. Not only does the government have an ownership interest in his private property, but now he has one in his physical being. Now, I should emphasize the extent to which the status policies are demonstrably devastating. Let's look at the environmental movement, because it requires our attention. The environmental movement became prominent in the early 60s with Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. Carson was an opponent of pesticides. She asserted that the chemical DDT, which had been widely used to eradicate malaria, including in the United States, Europe, and Canada, destroyed wildlife, including birds, and exposed children to increased rates of cancer. In a 1972 case brought by the Sierra Club to ban production of DDT in the United States, an administrative law judge at the newly established Environmental Protection Agency found after listening to months of testimony and evidence that DDT was harmless to wildlife and people as used under the regulations. But his decision was overturned by the EPA administrator, William Ruckelshaus, who hadn't heard any of the evidence or read any of the testimony, but he banned it by himself anyway. As a result of this decision, many other industrialized nations followed the United States, and DDT became unavailable to the third world. DDT that had been used in places like Ontario and Boston, on playgrounds in the middle of the day, dropped from helicopters. We used to have malaria in this country, you know. Now, this banning led to the death of millions and millions of poor children in Africa and Southeast Asia, but Rachel Carson remains an icon, and the Sierra Club remains a favorite media force for expertise on the environment. Environmental extremism kills, and it kills a hell of a lot of people. And now they move on to their latest, which is global warming, which they now call man-made climate change because the world actually isn't warming, it appears to be cooling or most of us call it the Four Seasons, you know. <laughs> or in Ann Arbor, they call it the Two Seasons, summer and winter, you know. 
Obama, Congress, and the EPA want to define as a matter of law, not science. Carbon dioxide, which you exhale as you breathe, as a pollutant, which in turn must be reduced and regulated. And in order to do this, the federal government would have the power to dictate carbon dioxide emission levels and fine and punish those who exceed them. So in essence, this would empower the government to dictate economic and personal decisions at virtually every level of the society. And keep in mind, carbon dioxide is actually a very small fraction of greenhouse gases. You know what the biggest one is? Water vapor. They haven't figured out how to control that yet. And yet, without carbon dioxide, we would die. The earth would freeze because plants use it to produce oxygen. And now we have this recent scandal. These leading so-called climate experts have been caught red-handed, and I do mean red-handed, distorting temperature data, lying about warming trends, destroying contrary evidence, messing with their so-called models and smearing experts who disagree with them. It's a monumental scientific scandal. And unless you read conservative publications and listen to talk radio, you never heard of it. And the status could care less. Despite the evidence, Congress and the administration are hell-bent on using junk science to get their hands around our society and control everything from light bulbs we are legally permitted to use and livestock flatulence. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? You ought to hear the farmers who call into my show. <laughs> now, as I wrote in Liberty and Tyranny, so distant is America today from its founding principles that it is difficult to precisely describe the nature of America's government. It's not strictly a constitutional republic because the Constitution has been and continues to be easily altered by a judicial oligarchy, except for Clarence Thomas, that most, that most enforces, if not expands, the statist's agenda. It is not strictly a representative republic because so many edicts are produced by a maze of administrative departments that are unknown to the public and detached from its sentiment. And it's not strictly a federal republic, because the states that gave the central government life now live at its behest. So what is it? It's a society steadily transforming towards statism. If the conservative does not come to grips with the significance of this transformation, he will be devoured by it. That said, in the face of this onslaught, it would be suicidal for us to abandon our principles. We must teach these principles. They have been passed to us from past generations and have proven themselves. Throughout the history of mankind, these principles have worked and no others. Now is not the time for compromise. Who shall we compromise with? Which principles shall we surrender? And to what end? If we can't stop this soft tyranny, if we can't stand up to it, then when will we? Now is not the time to lower our voices. Now is the time to be heard loud and clear. And if we are not resolute now, then we will never be resolute. All of you here, you're very intelligent, you're motivated people, or you wouldn't be here. Your society is under attack. Our governmental institutions are being used against us. I know it upsets some people when I talk this way, but we don't have time to play word games in my view. We don't have time to deny reality. These people are trying to dispirit you. They are trying to overwhelm you. They want you to accept their agenda as inevitable, and they want you to give up. You are extremely crucial in this battle. You are the generals in this battle, whether you like it or not. It took decades to get to this point, 
and it will take decades to contain and unravel it. The status never gives up, and neither do we. We must become more engaged in public matters. It is in our nature to live and let live, to attend to our family, to volunteer, and to quietly assist a friend, a neighbor, or even a stranger. These are admirable qualities that contribute to the overall health of the community, but it's not enough anymore. If we are to win this struggle, it will require reinforcements. A new generation of activists, larger in number, shrewder, and more articulate than before, who seek to blunt the status counter-revolution, not imitate it, and gradually and steadily reverse course. More conservatives than before will need to seek elective and appointed office, fill the ranks of the administrative state, hold teaching positions in public schools and universities, and find positions in Hollywood and the media where they can make a difference in infinite ways. The status does not have a birthright ownership to these institutions. We must fight for them, mold them, and where appropriate, eliminate them. Parents and grandparents must take it upon themselves to teach their children and grandchildren to believe in and appreciate the principles of the American civil society and stress the import of preserving and improving it. They will need to teach their offspring that the status threatens their generation's liberty and prosperity and to resist ideologically alluring trends. And in this regard, back to this all-important issue of language, the status has also become masterful at controlling the public vocabulary. For example, when challenged on global warming, he accuses the skeptic of being a denier, favoring corporate polluters, or being against saving the planet. Draconian measures that threaten liberty and prosperity, such as cap and trade, are marketed in appealing and benign slogans, such as going green. The status never destroys, he reforms. He never disenfranchises, he empowers. Well, this has to end, too. President Reagan understood the power of words. He deconstructed the status propaganda and framed the debate on his terms. He once said, how can limited government and fiscal restraint be equated with lack of compassion for the poor? How can a tax break that puts a little more money in the weekly paychecks of working people be seen as an attack on the needy. Since when do we in America believe that our society is made up of two diametrically opposed classes, one rich, one poor, both in a permanent state of conflict, and neither able to get ahead ex except at the expense of the other? Since when do we in America accept this alien and discredited theory of social and class warfare? Since when do we in America endorse the politics of envy and division? Some on our side want us to forget Reagan. I say we still have much to learn from him. And Margaret Thatcher, and Winston Churchill, and all the greats that came before us. We can stand on the shoulders of Madison, Hamilton, Washington, Franklin, Adams, or Obama, Pelosi, and Reed. <laughs> you pick. Let me close with a final quote from Reagan, which he gave, oddly enough, Dr. Arne at Hillsdale College, November 10, 1977. It's the last quote in my book. He gave it in a speech called Encroaching Control, the Peril of Ever-Expanding Government. And if you listen to my show, I think we've made this quote famous because I use it all the time. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children 
what it was once like to live in the United States where men were free. Those words were prescient. Let me just add, this is a bloodless war. You want to know what an almost impossible war was? It was the Civil War. It was Gettysburg, Vicksburg, one burg after another. 40,000, 50,000 casualties in every battle. A nation with 25 million people where almost every family was touched. The South was running out of adult men. You want to know what fighting this enemy is like? Now, we have a different battle on our hands. In some ways, it's more complicated. There isn't a battlefield. These people are using the instrumentalities and the tools of our own government against us. The unelected branches, there are four branches of government if you haven't figured it out yet, including the administrative state. Larry taught me that 13 years ago. He was right. The faceless bureaucrats have more power than any other part of the government. That said, if our ancestors could fight as they fought in the Civil War, in World War I, World War II, and subsequent wars. Surely we have the resources and the grit and the motivation to take on our adversaries today. It's a different battlefield, it's a different time. Institutions like Hillsdale College are crucial. They're absolutely crucial. As a matter of fact, Hillsdale College needs to be 10 times the size it is. Because unless we send young, liberty-minded people out into society by the thousands, how are we going to win this thing? Unless they understand what we just talked about here tonight, Larry and I and others, how are we going to win this thing? We have got to help the next generation. Because to be perfectly honest with you, this battle that's being led in Washington against us today is mostly being led against the next generation. They're the ones who are going to have to pay these bills. They're the ones that are going to lose their liberty. They're the ones that are going to go without opportunity. I look at my kids, 21 and 18, as you look at your kids and your grandkids, and I think to myself, if we don't take a stand right now, if we don't draw the line right now, if we don't for once and for all say enough is enough and we will fight you at every level, we will use your language against you, we will go to the polls and we will defeat you, unless we do that now, I think it will be extremely difficult to recover. But here's the good news. There's more of us than them. There's, uh, and I'll say it, you may not want to put it in your transcription. There are more of us than the brown shirts wearing purple shirts over there across the hallway, as a matter of fact. There are more of us than ACORN and the ACLU and the rest of the left wing kook groups put together. But we but we can't sit back anymore. Now many of you don't sit back, but your neighbors do. Well, wake them the hell up. Your family members, wake them the hell up. You are the Paul Revere's. If each of you get another two, three, four, five people interested in their, their country, in their society, we will overwhelm them. God bless you. Thank you, Larry Arn and Hillsdale. <laughs>